Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And not only am I super excited to be your host and moderator this evening, I am incredibly grateful to all of you who have chosen to join in on tonight's event. Maybe you've seen us in some other events. You've tuned into all of these Wednesday night ones that we've broadcast so far. Maybe you've engaged with us on social media. Thank you to all of you for continuing to be part of our community during this time. And thank you to our members for your continued support. We're, we've been able to pull off some really, really wonderful broadcasts with all of your help, with all of your support. And of course, with all of your engagement, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you for tuning in to all the other ones that you've seen so far. And thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight's presentation is called Canaries in the Mine, Three Billion Birds Lost, and is going to address some issues in the ornithology community, including declines in avian populations and some strategies that you can use to help mitigate these trends in your local area. I'm really excited to be able to welcome two incredible experts this evening, Dr. Garth Spellman from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and Arvind Punjabi from Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. I would also like to acknowledge that tonight's event is presented in partnership with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science with promotional support from Denver Audubon and Audubon Rockies. So I have seen several people pop in the chat to say, hey, we're part of the Audubon organization. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks for tuning in tonight. We are great to have, uh, we are grateful to have a wonderful network of ornithologists all across our beautiful state helping to protect amazing birds. A couple of logistics and housekeeping items for our broadcast this evening. The best way to communicate with us and relay your questions and comments to our experts is through the chat. I will be watching the chat all night tonight and will be able to direct questions and comments to our two experts so that they can answer them live and on the air. If you haven't already done so, take a moment to send us a message in that chat to say hi. Let us know where you're watching from this evening. Maybe you're sitting out on your back deck listening to birdsong. Maybe you're watching inside the house. Maybe you have family members, canines, felines with you. Maybe you have a bird nearby in your backyard that you're watching with. Uh, we would love to hear from all of you. A quick note about the chat. Um, I am the only one that's going to be able to see those messages this evening. Garth and Arvind will be able to as well. Um, but we are not having those messages be viewable to other participants in the chat. That's an added security feature to protect your privacy and keep our meetings secure. So if you're wondering why you're not seeing anyone's messages, that is intentional. As one last message before we kick it off, we are gonna be sharing screens this evening. So you might be able to see some videos, some photos. We have learned from experience that one of the best ways to ensure that all of you can view those media pieces uh, smoothly and see that screen share uh, is to make sure that the device that you're currently viewing on is the only one connected to your home network um, and make sure that you're not running a bunch of additional programs. Sometimes those big files can be hard to view if your computer is overburdened, so now would be a great time to take that step. Without any further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to our Curator of Ornithology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Dr. Garth Spellman. Garth, how you doing this evening? Doing great this evening. Thank you, Talia, and thank you for all that information. I'm sure everyone really appreciates it and is excited for this. I wanna thank you again uh, for joining us. We are really grateful that you're willing to reach out and spend your time with us during this difficult time. And as I say that, I also want to um, just extend. So I know that a lot of people out there have been affected personally from what we are all going through as a society right now. And I, I want to just say that our hearts go out to you. And we're really glad that you are spending this time with us. And you know, we are here to share so a bit of science, something we can think about and engage in. And we really do appreciate you spending our time, your time with us. Um, I am really pleased that we were able to offer this as a virtual experience. Uh, this was supposed to be an in-person lecture at the museum. And of course, that did not happen. But we were able to switch it, and now we can engage with people across the country. I know I saw people on that have connected from North Dakota, from Texas, and from California. So thank you so much. And this really is a great, um, a great chance to reach out and learn. And I also want to extend a thanks to our partners in this, the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, and Audubon Societies of Greater Rockies and of Denver, uh, we all share a common vision where connecting people to nature is a way to really make a bridge and allow or bring people in into the fold of the natural world and help preserve that natural world. Um, as a museum scientist and as an ornithologist, in the last month and a half, as I've been at home, I've received 
more emails from our community than I can even remember receiving in the last two years about people seeing natural phenomena in their neighborhood that they never noticed before this all happened. And I've been receiving lots of questions of, of asking about, you know, when humans take a step back, are, are we seeing, you know, life take a step forward? And I think in some ways we are. I mean, as a society, the shadow that we cast uh, across the natural world has been reduced as a result of, of this pandemic. And people are noticing more in their backyard as that life steps into the light a little bit. And so I think it's, it's really sort of an interesting transition to the talk we're going to hear tonight because we're going to hear about you know, loss of a tremendous amount of avian diversity, but we're also going to hear about small steps that we can do so as individuals and as a society to make a difference and possibly turn this trend around. And so I don't want to, I don't want to take much time away from our special, our, our guest of honor, Arvin Punjabi. So it is my pleasure to introduce him. He is an avian conservation scientist at the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, where he has worked since 2000 to conserve native bird species through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. He's the son of Swedish Indian Im immigrants raised in New England. Arvin has focused much of his adult life on the conservation of birds in Western North America, especially in Northern Mexico, where his work to develop the science, local capacity, awareness, appreciation, and partnerships needed to enable strategic conservation of critical habitat for migratory and resident birds in the Chihuahuan Desert Grass. So without further ado, Arvin, please take the stage. Thank you, Garth. That was a very nice introduction. Um, I too am very excited to be here tonight. And uh, although I miss uh, having the opportunity to speak to you all in the IMAX theater at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I think this is the next best thing, right? Being able to talk to you all right from my own home to you in your own home without any of us having to go anywhere. Just think of how much uh, carbon footprint we're avoiding. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. As a quick note to our audience, we may at some point, Arvind, when does your video come up? Uh, it'll come up after this first slide. Okay, you may not see it at first, folks, but it is playing. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I hope everyone is staying healthy and active during these challenging times. Uh, I really appreciate all of you making time. Come tune in and learn a little more about the canaries in the mine the loss of 3 billion birds from our environment over the last 50 years and what it means for us. Now, surely, I advance. Got a little trouble advancing slides, there we go. Um, so surely many of you are familiar with how coal miners used to use live canaries bring them down in the mines to monitor the bird's health for any signs of illness or sudden death. Now, why did they do this? And why a canary? Does anyone know? Feel free to type your thoughts into the chat box tonight on this or any other questions I might throw out at you or that you may have for me and we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. Well, it doesn't actually have anything to do with a canary per se, other than <clears throat> that they were readily available but rather it has to do with birds and birds' unique respiratory and circulatory systems that make them more vulnerable to airborne poisons like carbon monoxide, which is a very real but invisible threat to miners. Now, because a bird's metabolism demands more oxygen for sustained flight, especially at high altitudes where the air is thin, the anatomy of their lungs and heart has evolved to allow them to get an extra dose of oxygen each breath they take, both as they inhale and exhale. So relative to other small animals that miners might be able to carry down into the mine, like a mouse, a canary will respond to toxins in the air much more quickly 
because of how quickly they process the air, how much air they process. And this allowed the miners precious time to get out. Now this practice of using canaries in the mine continued right up until the mid 1980s when a machine was invented to take over this role. But the analogy of a canary in a coal mine has been used widely to reflect any type of sentiment that warns of impending doom. Now birds really are amazing creatures having evolved so many incredible adaptations physically, physiologically, and behaviorally. And if there's one upside to this whole shutdown that we've had to endure, as Garth was alluding to, it's hopefully that you're finding more time to get outside in your own backyards, local parks or open space, and to watch birds and witness the miracle of bird migration that's happening right now all around us. So for those who are looking, each day brings a new arrival and a new surprise. Soon our forests and fields will again be alive with the songs of birds that have been returning to our areas to reproduce for many tens of thousands of years, long before any human ever inhabited this part of the world. Right now, I want to take you to one of those ancient places, mixed grass prairies, Great Plains. Now imagine yourself standing in the dark in a wide open prairie just before the dawn. Soon the first songs of the dawn chorus begin to surround you, growing in volume and variety. In the prairie, the barrage of bird song emanates from the ground and the sky in three dimensions bringing a surreal feel to what is uniquely a two-dimensional landscape. You can't necessarily see them, but you know they're there. The melodic rhythms of lark buntings, high thin trill of grasshopper sparrows, and the clear cascading whistles of Western meadowlarks dominate the airwaves. Occasionally, the primordial calls of killdeer, marbled godwits, and pie-billed grebes punctuate the chorus, creating a virtual orchestra of bird songs. Sadly, the opportunity for this unique natural history and sensory experience is becoming harder and harder to find. Grasslands across the Americas continue to be converted from rangelands for raising cattle and other livestock, croplands for growing food, biofuels, and livestock feed, as well as making room for housing developments. As a result, grassland bird populations and dawn forests in the prairie have become quiet. But this isn't happening just in the prairies, it's happening everywhere, even right in our own backyards. So the title of my presentation tonight already gives up the punchline of our research. We've lost three billion birds just within my lifetime. Tonight, I'd like to provide a little more context around that finding and describe some of the methods behind how we arrived at that number, which required both some long-term massive field survey efforts, but also some innovative uh, approaches using modern technology to assess change in bird populations. I'll then take a deeper dive into the results and expose patterns of declines across various bird groups to show which groups have been have suffered the greatest losses and which have actually increased. There is, in fact, reason for hope coming out of this report as well. We'll touch on some of the drivers of decline. Although our study didn't direct, directly address drivers, there are some obvious connections to be made. Finally, we'll get into some of the key policy needs for how to reverse bird population declines and touch on some examples of conservation programs that are currently making a difference on the ground as well as seven simple things we all can do in our daily lives to make a difference for birds. But before I get into that, I wanna share a little bit about my own story, about how I got into this field of avian conservation science, especially for any younger listeners out there who might be curious about how one goes about getting into this field. I was lucky as a child that I was exposed to abundant nature in my very own backyard and also on summer camping trips to the Maine coast where I saw creatures great and small that I had never seen before, like the starfish, when I had, where I had abundant free time on my hands to literally get lost in the woods. I distinctly remember one afternoon wandering across the road from my campsite and stepping into a very large spruce tree at about eight years old, 
and coming face to face with my first neotropical migrant songbird. It was a black-throated green warbler. I didn't know it at the time, but I could identify it later in my memories. I'll never forget its bright yellow cheeks that were glowing at me like neon lights in the darkest vestments. It was around the same time that I first went to India with my family to connect with my Indian relatives, cultural roots, and fortunately for me, the amazing wildlife and wild places found there. It was my experiences there exploring the plains and foothills at the base of the mighty Himalayas on elephant back. Can't just go wandering on foot in tiger country, which allowed me to get up close and personal with deer, wild boar, jackals, jungle cats, and even other wild elephants. This is where I first learned of the extraordinary intellect of elephants when I saw this one here back its rear end into the opening of a doorway in the building that you see in the background there and open up its floodgates on someone who had just chased off this elephant, denying her retreat of sugar cane. These were exciting times for a boy of eight years old, scouring the jungle for hours each morning and afternoon <clears throat> from up on high on the back of an elephant in search of the ever elusive tiger. We had several close encounters with them in the underbrush, but never saw one until finally one morning we did. Now, in full disclosure, this photo is not from that moment, but it captures it so well with the darkness of the forest in the early morning and the light coming through the trees and hazy beams. The only difference between this photo and my memory really is that the tiger I saw was sitting on the road looking back at me with the sunlight hitting its back creating a glowing silhouette all around its massive form. I'll never forget that moment and how quickly and quietly that massive cat dashed off into the woods and how we took off after it on elephant back, hoping to get a second look. Now my experiences in India left a permanent mark on me and when I grew up and went to college, I was thrilled to discover that there was an entire field devoted to the study and conservation of wildlife. I switched majors immediately, eager to become a wildcat biologist, but was fortunate that my undergraduate university offered a variety of field-based learning opportunities, like field ornithology and a Florida field ecology trip, pictured here, which was taught over spring break, and where I quickly learned to identify and recognize birds in the field by sight and sound. This experience of learning to identify bird songs, many of which I'd been hearing my whole life but never knew what they were, forged an instant connection between me and the natural world through birds. Uh, as I quickly learned how birds connect us to the land, whether it's in a national park, your local open space, or in your own backyard. This training instilled a passion and drive to obtain my first job as a field ornithologist, which was working in the swamps of Louisiana and paid about $175 a week. Uh, and my job was to find bird nests and map bird territories and avoid getting bit by poisonous snakes so that we could better understand the effects of forest fragmentation on breeding songbirds. I got to ride ATVs into the swamp, which was pretty cool for a kid just out of college. And I learned firsthand about the wonders of the southeastern bottomland hardwood forests, perhaps one of the most underappreciated ecosystems on this continent. This in turn prepared me for my next field job where I volunteered my time to learn all sorts of new field skills, high volume bird banding, take blood samples to measure stress hormone levels and, and tabulites and blood. And where I lived in this flimsy $20 tent on a tick infested island for three months. Having paid my dues, these early experiences set me up for even better field jobs. And I soon found myself living in this field station deep in the hills of Western Panama surrounded by lush forests, tropical wildlife, and over 400 species of birds. And later, working in the wilds of Alaska, where I first got to experience the incredible abundance of wildlife and birds in this part of the world, studying the interactions between tens of thousands of migrating birds and marine mammals with the fish, tiny oily fish called smelt that spawned in the glacial rivers in springtime and attracted thousands of birds during their stopover. Eventually, I came for full circle back to Louisiana, where I was offered a field research assistantship at LSU to study migratory birds at the Mississippi Delta in spring after their nonstop Transgulf crossing. 
better understand how they were being affected by human activities and changes in the coastal marsh ecosystem. I even got to observe birds in mid-flight crossing the Gulf of Mexico from oil platforms hundreds of miles offshore. After grad school, I soon found my way to the Colorado Bird Observatory, which was undergoing a name change at the time, where I was put in charge of running the Bar Lake Bird Banding Station, among other things, just outside of Denver. When I landed at BCR, I knew I had found home. Not only did their mission to conserve birds and their habitats through an integrated approach of science, education, and stewardship resonate strongly with my own mission, but I also knew that I wanted to work for an organization where I wouldn't be constrained by the limits of government, priorities of industry, the additional responsibilities of academia. Also, Bird Conservancy's approach of working with people through an integrated approach and voluntary partnerships made a lot of sense to me, and it still does, since after all, birds won't just conserve themselves. People need them to Another thing that made a lot of sense to me about Bird Conservancy was their intentional efforts to work across boundaries to address bird conservation needs wherever they might exist. Now, because most birds are migratory, in order to conserve their populations, we need to consider their entire life cycle work across boundaries to address the most pressing problems. That approach has allowed me to draw on my international background, experience, and passion to conserve birds and their habitats here in the U.S. and internationally, especially in Mexico and other parts of Latin America. Now, can anybody guess which bird species it is that we're looking at here, just the range? The winters in the mountains of Central and South America migrates across the Gulf of Mexico in spring, then fans out across the continent, reaching its breeding ground the boreal forest. If you have any guesses, pop them in the chat. I see Jim guesses osprey. Kathy says hummingbird. Geese. Go. This might give you a clue here. Golden plover, hummingbird. Lots of guesses coming in. Yeah, well, take a look at here. This is another clue. Anybody recognize this bird? It's, uh, not necessarily the most familiar bird to everybody, but it is one of our most abundant land birds on the continent. Lots of guesses saying thrush, wrens, yes. Swainson's thrush. If you said Swainson's thrush, you were right. This amazing flyer travels thousands of miles each year, find its way from where it was born in the north to its ancestral wintering grounds in the tropics. Then back and forth again and again for up to 10 years or more between the exact places on earth it calls home. So like the birds, one of the benefits I've enjoyed working here at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies is getting to travel to much of the hemisphere to connect with other bird conservationists, share experience and knowledge, develop partnerships and joint conservation strategies, and simultaneously get to know the bird communities and ecosystems in these places and see how our migratory birds live during the other parts of their life cycle and learn about the conservation challenges they face firsthand. Much of this travel has been in connection to my work with Partners in Flight, an umbrella organization of government agencies, NGOs, academia, foundations, industry, and private citizens across the hemisphere dedicated to the goals of keeping common birds common and helping species at risk through voluntary partnerships. Much of my work with PIF, as we call them for short, has revolved around the conservation status assessment of North American birds, which I maintain in a database as part of my work at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Now, our meetings are typically spent poring over the results of new data and analyses on bird status and trends. And it's precisely this part of my job with this group of partners that provided the impetus collaborative framework for the research on the decline of the North American avifauna that I'll be sharing tonight. Now, many of you are probably here because you appreciate the wonder of birds. But besides bringing us joy, remember, birds are also sensitive indicators to the health of the overall environment, the literal canaries in the cold. So what does it mean to lose more than a quarter of the continent's birds in just our lifetimes? Well, declines in migratory birds are not new, unfortunately. I'll take you back to another moment in time more than 50 years ago, 
Rachel Carson, published the book Silent Spring, which helped give birth to the modern environmental movement and resulted in the banning of harmful pesticides, such as DDT. Now, Carson was a bird watcher, and some of the key evidence she gathered for a book were the declines in birds she observed in the area where she lived. Now, Chandler Robbins was a friend of Rachel Carson, who worked at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In response to Silent Spring, he had the vision to create the North American Breeding Bird Survey in 1966 as a means of tracking changes in bird populations across the continent. The BBS, as it's widely known among bird watchers and conservationists, consists of thousands of volunteer-run survey routes across the U.S. and southern Canada, and it's our primary source of data on bird populations continentally. And the Robbins et al. analysis was the first one to sound the alarm on the declines of 156 neotropical migrant songbird species, roughly a quarter of all breeding bird species in the United States and Canada. More recent analyses of population change have been included in state of the birds in the US and Canada, which present bird population trends as indicators of overall environmental health. The indicator lines represent the average population trends across groups of species. Note in this graph the declines in grassland birds, arid land birds, and forest birds, and the increase in wetland birds. But what these indicators don't tell us is the number of birds lost or gained, and whether the total abundance of our birds in our environment has changed. This basic question is what we posed at the beginning of our study. July of 2017. If we take into account both increasing and declining species, has there been a net change in bird population abundance? Or are we simply seeing a shift towards increasing habitat generalists, urban adapted species, or invasive species? To answer this question, we needed to compile the most reliable estimates of both population trend and population size for as many bird species as possible. We relied on long-term monitoring data sets from both community scientists, in particular the BBS, uh, but also the Christmas bird count for species seen mainly in winter, as well as other surveys conducted by professional wildlife biologists, such as aerial waterfowl surveys that are conducted by plane. The most important thing was that these were long-term data sets collected in a consistent manner, covering a significant portion of the continental population of each species. Now, the BBS was especially important, providing data on the majority of species in our analysis. The BBS uh, is a scientifically rigorous population count performed by a, by a highly skilled, largely volunteer workforce, nearly 2,500 observers. Each year, these observers visit most of the survey's 4,500 routes, where observers conduct three minute counts of all the birds they see and hear every half mile along each 24 and a half mile long route. We're very lucky to have this 50 year data set of coast to coast annual bird counts from the DPS. This simply doesn't exist for any other group of organisms. And it's the product of an incredible collaboration between scientists and birds. We big, excuse me, we began with assessing and compiling the best data available on the North American population size of the species, drawing heavily again from the BBS as well as other sources, such as the US Shorebird Conservation Plan and the North American Waterfowl Management. We did a similar effort for population trends. Fortunately, much of the data for both these parameters, especially for the land birds, were readily available from the Partners in Flight Avian Conservation Assessment Database, which is what I manage at the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. But we incorporated some additional data sources that we hadn't previously, such as shorebird migration surveys, Arctic geese surveys, and other long-term single species surveys like singing, the Woodcock Singing Ground Survey. Synthesizing these data sets and getting them into the right format for the analysis was a huge job that took the better part of the first year of the project. When complete, this resulted in population size and trend estimates for 529 species of birds, roughly 75% of all North American breeding bird species. But 
This 75% represents more than 95% of the total breeding bird abundance. These data were then combined into a single hierarchical model that explicitly incorporated the uncertainty in both trend and size estimates. Produce estimates of overall change in bird populations for each North American biome and each bird family. However, because even the best survey data rely on human observers, we wanted a completely independent measure of bird abundance for corroborating these assessments of population change. For that, we turned to a tool that has been used by ornithologists to study bird migration for a number of decades now, namely weather radar. Doppler weather radar in particular, which is a newer technology that measures the direction and speed of objects like drops of rain, but which can also detect and measure the magnitude of bird migration in the sky over the US. In this graphic, each of the blue blossoming masses you see represents increasing numbers of birds aloft in the air around Doppler weather radar stations. These are birds literally taking off from the ground and migrating. Due to their larger size and distinctive movement patterns, birds create a unique reflectivity signal that can readily be distinguished from other airborne objects like rain or even insects. The intensity and extent of these signals is measured, recorded, and archived continuously for each Doppler weather radar station, providing a completely independent means for measuring change in a large number of migratory species. By adding up the data from 143 NEXTRAD weather radars across the US, a huge data set that required supercomputers to analyze, co-author Adrian Doctor was able to estimate the total cumulative volume of bird migration over the entire spring season, and then could look back through time to see this total biomass of migration has changed over time. Here on this map, the areas in white represent a higher intensity of migration. So you can see the majority of birds migrating coming up through the central part of the United States and the eastern part of the United States, also along the west coast, but to a lesser degree, the Rocky Mountain West. You have to take any questions about this later on. Now, before I get into the results, can anybody tell me what kind of bird this is we're looking at? There are two very similar species of this type of bird in the U.S. Which one is it? Key field mark visible on this bird. If you think you know, go ahead and type your answer into the chat box. I'm Don't seeing worry. a lot of comments saying meadowlark, specifically western meadowlark. Ooh, very good. Couple saying eastern as well. This is one of the toughest bird ID challenges we have in, in the U.S. Uh, of course, their songs are very different, uh, but uh, they are very similar. But yes, it is a Western metal art for all those who are Western metal art. Good job. So when we ran the numbers, the results of all this were both staggering and sobering. Across all 529 species, we saw net population loss of 2.9 billion birds since 1970. This represents a 29% reduction in total breeding bird abundance across the app. More than 300 species showed a significant decrease in population. That's more than half of all the birds. And we broke down this loss for groups of species in several ways, such as across the major biomes, which are shown in the inset map in the upper right here. As well as by bird families, we saw that grassland birds were particularly hard hit, which perhaps was no big surprise since we had known for a long time that grassland birds were declining. Likewise, with shorebirds, we've also known that they've been declining for quite some time. But we were surprised to see large losses in other groups of birds as well, whose habitat appears relatively secure, like boreal forest birds and western forest birds. This is particularly relevant for states like Colorado, which are essentially dominated by western forests and grasslands. When we looked across the biomes, we see a net loss in nearly all habitats, including in generalists. 
On this slide, the absolute change in abundance for each biome is shown in the right panel, and the relative change in abundance is shown on the left. So those figures we were seeing on the previous graphs were relative change. And so you see grassland birds again here have suffered the most loss relative to uh, the number of species in that group with 53% uh, total loss. And the absolute loss of grassland birds is also staggering. Over 700 million birds have been lost from that ecosystem just since 1970. That's roughly one out of every four birds lost in North America over the last 50 years. So we estimate that the boreal forest birds have lost also about half a billion birds, and that both forest generalists and habitat generalists have lost hundreds of millions of birds as well. The only biome to show a moderate increase was wetland birds, which you can see at the top here, each figure. But you can see these don't come close to compensating for the losses. This is because wetland bird populations are much smaller than most terrestrial bird populations. And when we break down the results more finely by taxonomic bird families, we see that there are some winners and losers. In this figure, the wheel graphs represent the absolute change in abundance within each family. Red wheel is for families showing a net loss in abundance, and the blue wheel is for families that show a net gain in abundance. Note the size of the wheels are proportional, so there's a total loss of 3.2 billion birds and a total gain of only 250 million birds. The majority of this loss has occurred in several large bird families, especially the sparrows, warblers, and the blackbirds, although total 38 families show a net population loss and 10 families have lost more than 50 million birds each. On the other hand, 29 bird families show a net gain. Among the biggest winners in this group are the waterfowl, raptors, and surprisingly, vireos. Now this Last result is surprising because vireos share many of the same habitats as some of these declining species. So the reason for their increase is not really clear. However, the reason for the increases in raptors and waterfowl is more clear. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Perhaps the most surprising result is that half of the total net loss of birds is made up of only 10 very common and widespread species that are probably very familiar to all of us. These are birds include the horned lark, dark-eyed junco, savannah sparrow, and red-winged blackbird. These are examples of familiar birds that have lost hundreds of millions of individuals just in my lifetime, roughly half a century. So a key finding from our analysis is that bird population declines and loss are not just restricted to rare and threatened species, but are pervasive among common and widespread species. Even more surprising, perhaps, is that some of the steepest declines and largest loss of individuals have occurred in several introduced species, especially the much maligned house sparrow and European starling. But perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised. These species are actually declining within their native ranges as well. This is also very telling. If we can't sustain house sparrow populations or starling populations or rock pigeons on the landscape, something is very wrong. Now the results of the radar analysis mirrored the ground surveys. We were only able to go back 11 years to look at change in total migration volume due to changes in the technology used for processing radar data and being able to filter out ground noise uh, and other types of noise. Um, <clears throat> we also looked only at spring migration data, as I mentioned before. Spring migration volume is much more closely aligned with the total breeding population size than the fall migration volume when bird populations can be triple what they are in the spring as a result of successful breeding. So the red circles here indicate individual radar stations that saw a significant decline in spring migration over the past decade, and the blue circle, 
circles indicate stations that saw a significant increase in spring migration. The size of the circle reflects the relative magnitude of the change, and open circles reflect slightly greater uncertainty around the degree of change indicated. So the declines were mostly identified in the central and eastern U.S. West of the gray shaded area, trends were too weak or variable to show a statistically significant pattern. Now, when we combine the trend surface with the cumulative biomass passage, we get a surface map of the loss of biomass of spring migration over the U.S. And you can see, breaking these up into flyways, that the majority of losses are in the Mississippi and Atlantic flyways. This is, again, according to the radar data. So there are significant declines in bird migration in the Mississippi and Atlantic flyways, but in the Pacific and Central flyways, we did not find a significant trend. Now, why is this? Well, one important consideration is that the total change in volume of bird migration as measured by radar really reflects long distance migrants, such as boreal forest birds, more so than short distance migrants as the long distance migrants are more likely to be picked up on multiple radar stations as they move north. We also found an overall decline in spring migration biomass across the continent, a loss of 14% just since 2007. This calculates out to about 1.5% per year, which is similar to the magnitude of decline, total decline we saw in the field survey data. And why does this matter? Well, we know that species decline before they become endangered or go extinct. We've essentially lost a passenger's pitch, passenger pigeons worth of birds in less than our lifetime. The decline of the passenger pigeon probably looked a lot like the declines we are seeing in many of other species right now. Thankfully, today we have long term monitoring programs in place to alert us to population declines before it's too late so society can act prevent extinctions. The loss of abundance in common and widespread species also signals the loss of ecosystem integrity, with broad ramifications not only for our native ecosystems, but also for our farmlands, parks, and backyards, where birds play keystone roles in regulating insect populations and thereby maintaining healthy landscapes. Surely the loss of over one-third of all birds from the boreal forest must have cascading effects on insect abundance, plant defoliation and survival, and ultimately forest health, and the well being of all other species. Similarly, the loss of birds from our agricultural landscapes reflects the reduced fertility and resilience of these lands to produce harvests without increasing dependence on pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer. We're also diminishing, if not outright losing, the spectacle of bird migration one of the great natural wonders on the planet. Birds make un unimaginable journeys across oceans and continents, sometimes in staggering concentrations, spending a significant portion of their life on the wing en route between their winter and summer homes. Whereas most of us can probably recall some moment in time where we witnessed the abundance of birds during migration, whether it was a murmur of starlings or a flock of geese, as bird populations declines, these sightings become less frequent, and this spectacle becomes less known. Finally, as mentioned already, birds are the little, literal canary in the coal mine, and their widespread declines parallel those of other taxa, such as insects, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Keeping common birds common makes conservation sense for the reasons listed above, and if for nothing else, for the economic reasons. Covering endangered species is costly, both to taxpayers and private landowners. So what are the primary causes of these declines? Well, our study didn't specifically address the causes. Uh, these are not easy to pin down for individual species, but 
we know lots uh, from lots of other evidence that habitat loss and degradation are still number one drivers of bird declines. A common theme in the largest declines, grassland birds plus other common species of open fields like red-winged blackbirds and even some of those introduced birds, is that these are birds associated with agricultural landscapes. What we're seeing with the intensification of agriculture is where not long ago there were fallow fields or grassy margins or hedgerows. Now it's simply horizon to horizon cornfields and other crops. And there's more intensive use of more and more toxic pesticides. This combined with urban sprawl, loss of tropical forests where many of our birds winter, migrate through, we're seeing every bit of nature squeezed out to the point where our landscapes cannot support native populations anymore. On top of this are the many other human caused factors that we know kill huge numbers of birds, the largest of which is free ranging cats, both domestic and feral, followed by collisions with windows in a distant second place, collisions with towers and other structures such as wind turbines, and even further distant third place. These might not be the primary drivers of the declines, but they make it more difficult for birds to survive in the remaining habitats. And these are all things that we can do something about. We have proven solutions for minimizing this human-caused mortality. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. Because the declines are so pervasive across so many habitats and groups of bird species, birds are facing multiple interacting threats. And many of these are difficult for us to measure, such as the effects of pesticides, energy development, light pollution from cities, or the increasing frequency of extreme weather, all of which are ex exacerbated by climate change. Well, you'll be glad to know that there are reasons for hope. We know many of the problems and solutions, and we have numerous examples of successful conservation efforts that we can draw on to guide us forward through these challenging times. Well, when limiting factors are identified and removed, conservation works. Bird populations are resilient and they respond favorably. Just look at the remarkable recovery of the bald eagle and other birds of prey. When we remove DDT from the environment and reduce persecution, populations have rebounded in response. Perhaps the most hopeful example is the increase in waterfowl populations, more than a 35% increase since 1970. And this is not an accident. It was waterfowl hunters who noticed population declines and did something about it. They raised their voices, put their money where their mouth was, and passed the Pittman-Robertson Act to tax firearms and ammunition sales in order to support waterfowl management and habitat conservation. They also helped pass the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, which created a dedicated funding stream that has protected and restored millions of acres of wetlands from Canada down throughout Latin America. As a result, duck populations rebounded, providing sustainable recreational hunting. The big question moving forward is how do we replicate these successes for other birds? Now, another reason for hope is the phenomenal response we had to the publication of our paper last year. Hundreds of articles from more than 1,700 media outlets in the U.S. and beyond covered the story. It reached a total of 3.8 billion people on the planet and had broad appeal across the political spectrum. The reporting on, on the article was largely accurate, positive, very large. In fact, even The Onion picked up the story, signaling it had truly grabbed the mainstream attention. Never mind that penguins, ostriches, and macaws played no role in our data analysis. The online media output tracking website Altmetric ranked our article in the top 0.0017% of all research outputs ever tracked for quantity and quality of online coverage. The response was emotional, <clears throat> with letters to the editor, political cartoons, and editorials. 
Even a children's newspaper, Newsomatic, picked up the story. Is it too late? What can people do? Now, I bet everyone recognizes this. Go ahead and type its name into the chat box if you know what it is. Lots of comments coming in to say Snowy Owl. I thought so. Hard to mistake that bird for anything. Very distinctive. Yes. Well, in response to the results that we've lost 3 billion birds since 1970, a coalition of bird conservation organizations launched the Bird Crisis Campaign to sound the alarm and promote action. With key messages and digital media assets available at a shared partner website, 3billionbirds.org. The 3billion.org, 3billionbirds.org website presents details on the findings of the paper, press releases, fact sheets, and a wide range of digital media assets that are freely available for other institutions to use and especially to share on their websites and social media. It's also the only place where you can download uh, the original paper from science. In addition, the site points people to solutions, mostly in the form of seven simple actions that we can all take to help birds. These are things that individuals can do in their daily lives uh, to make a difference for birds. Each of these actions can be also taken to a larger scale by being active in their communities or ultimately creating change at the policy or societal level. Again, you can go to 3billionbirds.org to learn more about each of the seven simple actions. Let's go through them here now. So action number one is to reduce mortality from glass windows. Windows kill an estimated 200 million birds per year in the US alone. And these aren't just skyscrapers. Most mortality actually takes place at residential locations where birds see the reflections of vegetation and sky and make a fatal split second decision to fly into the glass. But there are many proven solutions for making windows safer for birds including several products that break up the reflections so birds can see the windows, and measures to turn off lights in cities during periods of peak migration. Now, there's also legislation uh, being considered now that makes it mandatory for all federal buildings to use bird-friendly glass designs. That's a start. New York City legislation is strongest so far currently. On the day that our paper was published, excuse me for falling behind on my animations here. On the day that our paper was published, we received a YouTube video from the office of a Republican Congressman, uh, Cong Congressman Griffiths from Virginia, who was in a debate about the Bird Safe Windows Act and held up a press release at the, from about our article at the, t at the time and declared, we don't need to debate this bill anymore. We need to pass it. Now the second action is a bit more controversial. Outdoor cats kill more than 2 billion birds per year and even a larger number of small mammals and reptiles just in the US alone. But our society refuses to solve this problem and the number of feral and outdoor cats continues to grow. Again, there are known solutions such as keeping your cat indoors, starting as a kitten, or building catios that allow cats to go outdoors without hunting birds. But the standard practice is still TNR, trap, neuter, and release, which essentially creates subsidized colonies of bird killers, often in parks and other public spaces. Other countries such as Australia and New Zealand have moved aggressively to deal with the epidemic of invasive feral cats, which have caused the collapse of numerous endangered species populations in those countries. It's time for the US and Canada to follow suit before this problem becomes even more problematic. Now, trust me, I love cats. I have two of my own, but it's simply irresponsible given what we know about the declines in birds, the effects of cats, free roaming cats on birds, to let these hunters roam free in our backyards and open spaces to hunt their pleasure where they then decimate bird populations, both common and rare species alike. 
we need to change this pattern. The next action is an obvious one. Use native plants in yards and parks and reduce the amount of lawn. Currently, the U.S. has 40 million acres of cultivated lawn. That's three times greater than any irrigated crop. Not only are lawns sterile environments for insects, but they require harmful chemicals to maintain. Planting natives attracts pollinators and other insects, provides food and nesting sites for birds. Birds nesting in neighborhoods with higher proportion of native vegetation have higher reproductive success. Urban green spaces can be beneficial for birds as well, with some breeding birds uh, using these places in urban environments, but it's also especially important habitat during stopover and a great way for people in cities to be able to see some of these rare birds migrating through that are only there for a short period of time. Now, reducing the use of pesticides and other chemicals is something that individuals can do around their homes and yards, but the more intensive use of more and more toxic pesticides for agriculture could be one of the largest global environmental issues of our time. Common pesticides called neonicotinoids could be the next DDT and have been implicated in global declines in insect populations, as well as aerial insectivores and grassland birds. Also shown to cause birds to become disoriented, lethargic, stop eating, and lose weight during their migration in the springtime after just eating one or two of these seeds. And this is right when these birds need to be migrating and moving on quickly towards their breeding grounds to secure high quality breeding territories and mates. So, where these pesticides are being applied largely in the central portion of the United States and Canada. They are still affecting birds that breed in the boreal forest and other places further north and could be driving population declines in those species as well. But the growing human population needs food, so this is not an easy problem to fix. But there are alternatives to industrial scale agricultural production. And one of the solutions is for us to pay attention to where our food comes from and how it's produced. Whenever you can, buy local. Another one of the simplest actions one can do to help birds is to drink bird-friendly coffee. Now, all the coffee we, we drink is grown in tropical regions, and in most areas, tropical rainforests are cleared to grow the coffee. But rustic varieties of coffee are still grown under a canopy of shade, which leaves enough trees to provide critical habitat for migratory birds, as well as many other tropical resident species. What's nice is that shade-grown coffee is also great coffee, some of the best. And paying attention to certifications for shade-grown, trying to get local coffee shops to serve shade-grown coffee is a great way to help us. The gold standard for certification is the Smithsonian's bird-friendly coffee. We're also working on bird-friendly cacao and other products. Another simple action we can take is to reduce the use of plastics in our lives, especially one-time use plastics. And this is something that our society is starting to make some progress on because of all the publicity around the effects of, on marine life, like the floating plastic trash uh, island in the Pacific Ocean. For birds, the main concern is with seabirds that mistake small bits of plastic for prey items and sometimes travel hundreds of miles on feeding trips to then regurgitate the plastic down back to their chicks, which then die of starvation with their bellies full of plastic. Thankfully, there are more and more alternatives to single-use plastics, and many places have ordinances that mandate the use of reusable bags or other alternatives to single-use plastics. Action number seven is to pay attention to the birds and to enter your sightings into eBird or other citizen science applications, or simply share what you see with your friends, families, and neighbors. Most of the data we used in our analysis of bird population came from long-term monitoring data sets collected by community scientists. Neat collaborations where scientists can design the monitoring programs and analyze the data 
but ordinary bird watchers are the eyes of the world who are collecting the data in the field. Now we didn't use eBird in this particular analysis because it's only been available for about 10 years or so, but we do use it in our status assessment work that I've referred to a few times. There's no doubt that eBird will continue to grow and be one of our primary tools for tracking bird populations in the future. And the development of new analysis methods that can integrate eBird with other more structured monitoring data sets will make the data even more valuable for conservation. So there's eBird. <laughs> I hope many of you are familiar with this application already uh, and use it. Uh, I certainly do. It's a great way to keep track of your bird sightings. Uh, both each day and over time. Now, we know that individual actions will not be enough to bring back 3 billion birds. We also need some broad scale changes. As we are completing the science paper, we are also working simultaneously on the 2019 State of the Birds Report, which used the results to underscore the urgency of the bird crisis and the importance of state wildlife agencies in addressing that crisis. The report was aimed at supporting new legislation, in particular, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, that would create a new dedicated funding stream of $1.4 billion per year for states, territories, and tribal agencies to implement their state wildlife action plans, which have identified over 12,000 species of greatest conservation, most of which are non-game wildlife species that currently only receive less than 10% of all agency funding for wildlife. This bill has been introduced in the House, uh, has 116 co-sponsors and strong bipartisan support. This could be the kind of game changer we need as it would increase uh, the available funding for states to address their state wildlife action plans uh, by an order of magnitude, several orders of magnitude. Now, there are many structures and programs already in place to protect and restore habitats for birds and wildlife that also need to be supported, ranging from management of vast public lands uh, to a whole slew of private lands conservation programs, such as those in the Farm Bill, which is currently our largest source of conservation funding in the US. There's also a set of 18 migratory bird habitat joint ventures. These are partnerships that leverage public and private investment implement bird and habitat conservation uh, on a local regional basis. There's also more than 1,700 land trusts and the network of 24 million acres of private protected lands that's as large as the entire National Park Service system in the lower 48 states. Now, all these conservation efforts are underfunded or threatened by damaging policy changes. We need to increase by an order of magnitude the investments we make in these conservation programs, target them, be more effective in addressing key bird conservation issues if we're gonna reverse the decline of three billion birds. Now, sometimes when there is no infrastructure for conservation, you have to create your own. I'd like to touch on a program that I started at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies to address some of the most pressing conservation needs for grasslands, that group that's declined more than any other. The program is actually modeled after Bird Conservancy's stewardship work in the US, where we have private lands biologists embedded in natural resources conservation services offices to implement farm bill programs for grasslands and other critical ecosystems. Now, why are we working in the Chihuahuan Desert? Let's see if this anim animation will get started here. A little slow. This one was slow when I was running it earlier today for some reason. I'm afraid if I hit it again, it's gonna jump. There we go. So I'm gonna challenge you again to think about a bird that spends its winters in the desert regions and then migrates up into the Great Plains the summertime for returning the late summer back down to the desert regions where then it again spends the winters. Anybody have any guesses at what bird this is? 
without even seeing a picture of it. See a few guesses saying hummingbird, grasshopper, sparrow, morning dove, wren, bared sparrow, hummingbird. What is it? Those are some good guesses in there. Uh, how about now? Is that a lark bunting? I saw a few guesses saying that as well. Yes, it is our state bird, the lark bunting. And the lark bunting is a grassland bird, and it's one of those grassland birds that's lost well over 100 million individuals from its population. This is the last 50 years. There still are tens of millions of these birds, but we need to save what's left of them. And as you see, their populations concentrate in the grasslands of the deserts, particularly the Chihuahuan Desert. And so it's for birds like the lark bunting and a whole host of other birds that we developed this program called the Sustainable Grazing Network. Now, one of our primary areas of focus with the sustain, Sustainable Grazing Network uh, is to promote best management practices uh, to avoid degradation and eventual loss of grasslands. Uh, shrub encroachment in the grasslands has been perhaps one of the greatest factors affecting the extent of grasslands in the desert regions over the last 100 years. As you see in this graphic, uh, this photo, which is a compilation of three photos uh, taken going back as far as 1902, the whole century later, you can see that this Sonoran Desert grassland has transformed from what would have been suitable habitat for a bird like a lark bunting or a Baird sparrow to a completely different habitat. And this has affected a large extent of our grasslands over the last 150 years, especially in the desert regions, but also in the Southern Great Plains. So what we try to do with the Sustainable Grazing Network is to promote best management practices for grasslands, try to prevent them from looking like the type of grassland you see on the left side of the fence here, which has been severely overgrazed for many, many decades, and as a result, has transformed from a grassland to a shrubland. This affects the grassland birds. They can no longer use this type of habitat, uh, and our data shows that they avoid it, and when they do come into close proximity to a lot of shrubs, uh, they suffer lower survival because the shrubs draw in a whole suite of predatory birds that normally would not occur in a wide open grassland. So some of our restoration efforts in the Sustainable Grazing Network target the removal of shrubs in invaded grasslands, such as this site here on a ranch in Chihuahua. Here's what it looked like before we came in. Here's what it looked like right after. Not pretty, but you can see we've taken out most of the shrubs. Not all of them, we leave some. And another year later, you see the grasses have come back, the shrubs mostly dead, and the area has returned to a state of grasslands that can support some of these rapidly declining grassland birds. In total, this program now has seven, 27 ranches uh, that we expect to be enrolled by the end of the year. Uh, we're getting close to 600,000 acres included in this network. Uh, and what we do is we provide cost share and technical assistance to landowners for developing and implementing range and wildlife management plans. And then we conduct range improvements such as fencing projects or water, infra water infrastructure projects, which are needed to support uh, grazing management and also habitat restoration and enhancement like you saw in the previous slides. Uh, we also conduct bird and vegetation monitoring, particularly for those wintering grassland birds. And we've also uh, adopted the Aplomato falcon as one of our conservation priority targets in this area. The Chihuahuan Desert Aplomato Falcon is one of the most endangered birds in this ecosystem. There are only a handful left. Uh, and so what we do is we put out nesting platforms like this. You see they have bars around the edges. This prevents uh, other predators like great horned owls 
from coming in and killing the chicks at night. We also install stock tank ladders in areas, especially around Apalmato falcons, but throughout the ranches, so that birds not just can get out of a tank if they fall in, and we have had Apalmato falcon drown as a result of falling in a tank in the water, but primarily so that they can safely access the water. We found that once we put these escape ladders into these stock tanks, the birds don't actually use them to escape, they use them to safely access the water and so they don't fall in. Again. The map on the left here shows the extent of our, of our sustainable grazing network in Chihuahua, just south of the U.S. border. And the ranches in dark green are those ranches that we currently have enrolled. There's a whole bunch more ranches that are of high conservation interest that with additional boots on the ground, additional people in the field to work with landowners, uh, we could get conservation going on these ranches as well. Now, back to the large scale policy initiatives. I want to bring up a very important development that you may or may not be familiar with regarding our current administration's recent reinterpretation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, one of the nation's oldest environmental laws that dates back over 100 years. The new interpretation means that industry, governments, and individuals are no longer subject to the threat of prosecution or fines for the incidental killing of birds, only the intentional killing of birds, even if those bird deaths could have been expected or prevented. Now, of course, no companies set out to intentionally kill birds, but many activities in the course of normal business could harm birds if, if adequate precautions are not taken. However, now there's no regulatory incentive to do the right thing, effectively gutting the law. This new interpretation means that even a disaster like the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010 that killed and sickened about one million birds and for which BP paid $100 million in fines, those responsible could no longer be prosecuted under the Migratory Bird Act for gross negligence. Now, this law has always been applied very sparingly and judiciously in the past hundred years, uh, with the realization that we've lost almost a third of our birds. Now is not the time to weaken the legal protections for them. We've been able to live with this law for many decades, and we've gotten by just fine. Unfortunately, this is just one of the many environmental policies that are currently being rolled back. So we all need to be paying close attention to what's happening and should be very concerned about these changes to our bedrock environmental laws. Now, to accomplish the broad scale change that's needed, people who love birds and nature need to become a political force. We're already a huge economic force contributing more than $80 billion annually just in terms of bird watching uh, economic activity. Uh, uh, young people have taken this into the street before with a climate march just recently, and this is the kind of energy that we need now to scale up our efforts. Now is the time to put nature, the environment, back on the front burner of the political agenda. Because right now is a moment in time for conservation, perhaps another moment like Silent Spring, where we have the chance to help change national consciousness and trajectory and scope of our efforts needed to save birds and the ecosystems that they represent and depend on. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Ken Rosenberg, Adrian Doctor from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Peter Blancher, uh, Adam Smith and Paul Smith from the Canadian Wildlife Service, John Sauer from the US Geological Survey, uh, Jessica Stanton, also from the USGS, uh, Michael Parr with American Bird Conservancy, Laura Helf, also with Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and Peter Mara, uh, formerly with the Smithsonian Institute, now with Georgetown University. I also want to thank uh, my co-author Ken Rosenberg for his generous contribution of slides and, and presentation materials, uh, as well as Texas Parks and Wildlife for the uh, footage we saw earlier of the grassland uh, at dawn. 
also my good friend and collaborator in Mexico, Jose Hugo Martinez, who provided me with many photos. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our hosts, Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I really enjoyed doing this talk. And thanks also to our local partners, Audubon Rockies and Denver Audubon, who support us in so many ways. Now, before I go, I want to leave you with those simple ways to help birds again so we don't forget, right? Let's make windows safe. Let's keep our cats indoors. Reduce the size of our lawns and plant more natives. Avoid pesticides whenever possible. Reduce plastics in our daily lives. Drink bird friendly coffee and watch birds and share what you see. Thank you so much, Arvind, for this wonderful presentation. And thank you to all of you who have tuned in, sent us your questions, and done a little bit of bird watching virtually with us this evening. I do see some questions that are saying, Are we going to be able to view this as a recording later? Yes, we will. And Arvind, I wonder if you have time to hang on for just a couple of quick questions. A lot of people had the same ones. And so I think we can probably get a lot of people's questions answered in just a few minutes. Garth is also answering some directly in the chat. There are lots of folks who are wondering what are some alternatives that they can maybe suggest to neighbors who continue to insist on using pesticides in their yard or insist on keeping their cats outside? What are some recommendations that they could make to people to help them? Sort of bridge that divide and make their yards and their pets a little bit more friendly to bird populations. Yeah, well, you know, human behaviors are are hard to change, but I think it starts with a conversation, uh, an educational conversation about why we should be concerned about these things, and also sharing information about what we know about what's happening to our birds and why. Uh, it's it's hard to ignore the fact that cats, especially at a local level, have a very big impact on bird populations. In fact, a recent study just came out uh, that was highlighted on NPR recently that showed that domestic cats can have a real impact on birds, especially, but even small mammals. And mostly that impact is within 100 yards of people's homes. If you put a 100-yard buffer around everybody's homes, that's a big area that's impacted by cats. So it's a, it's a cultural change that needs to happen. Uh, just like, you know, there are cultural um, norms uh, in Latin America, for example, of people keeping parrots in cages. Now, historically, these parrots were captured from the wild and, and kept as pets, and lived for many decades. Uh, but we're recognizing too that that's not sustainable. And uh, we need to slowly start making changes to move away from these uh, customary traditions. That makes a lot of sense. I agree. Um, I see a lot of questions, too, about um, what are some reasons for hope? A lot of people, I think, were really excited by your mention that raptor populations, wetland bird populations were actually increasing. And a lot of people are specifically wondering about vireos, too. So. What are the reasons that we would maybe see those populations increasing? Regulations, removal of DDT, and a lot of people are saying, why vireos? What's special about them? Yeah, well, I, I wish I had a, a good answer for the vireos. That is a very interesting uh, artifact of the analysis, and uh, it's, it seems real. It's, uh, but so why are vireos, which share many of these same forested habitats as, as our other species, why are they doing so well? Uh, you know, I wish I could answer that. Perhaps it has to do with the types of foods that they take. They do have, you know, slightly larger bills than many of the warblers or sparrows. Uh, they feed on different types of insects, perhaps. Uh, but that's just speculation on my part. Uh, this is an area that's ripe for research. Um, but with the other groups of birds that you mentioned, the waterfowl, we know very well what's worked. It's been dedicated conservation programs and policies that address uh, the protection of their habitat. If there's one takeaway message from this evening, that seems to be it, the dedicated conservation and policy work. Um, I know we are just about out of time for the evening, um, but I do see two last questions that I would love for you to address. One comes from one of our friends at Denver Audubon, wondering of those seven actions, what is something that someone who's interested in 
really starting to impact bird populations in their local area should take on first? One quick and easy one to start. Tomorrow. Hmm. Well, I, you know, I think that you have to think about what are the challenges in your area in particular. Uh, I mean, if you had to see, you know, feral cat colonies that are, you know, coming into your backyards and the parks, uh, you know, that might be priority number one. Uh, but something like that is going to take a deliberate, slow, and sustained approach. Um, you know, the easiest place to start is, of course, right in our backyards and to lead by examples to deal with problem windows. You know, not all windows are going to be as problematic for birds. It's probably the ones that are near the vegetation that they prefer, uh, whether it's an edge of a forest or a shrubland near your house where that brings birds close in. Uh, and that reflect you know, the sky uh, more so than others. Those are the problem windows to deal with first. You can talk to your neighbors about it too, see if they're having the same kind of problems. I'm sure most of us can probably relate to hearing a thud on a window and, uh, and going outside and looking to find a bird on the ground or walking into a, you know, a gl closed glass door ourselves, not realizing that there's glass there and feeling the shock of uh, an unexpected collision. Um, there's many ways you can do it. You can go have conversations with your local uh, local grocery store markets about uh, supplying bird-friendly coffee. Uh, yeah, I think any one of those, you know, is uh, is a place to start. So maybe pick the one that feels most attainable for you and that feels like will make the biggest difference in your immediate area. I think that's a good strategy. Um, and then one, perhaps the last one before we have to wrap up for the evening. I did see a couple of questions wondering, what spring migrant bird are you most looking forward to, to seeing? Oh, what spring migrant bird am I most looking forward to seeing? I think I will be happy when I see the lazuli bunting. It's one of my favorite backyard birds where I live. I'm fortunate that it comes into my backyards, uh, but it's also very common here in the foothills of uh, the Front Range, and it's not that common everywhere. So we're really lucky to have uh, an abundant population of that species, and it's one of our most beautiful birds. Very good. Well, before we sign off, I do want to say a huge thank you to all of you for tuning in, as well as a huge thank you to you, Arvind Punjabi, and Dr. Garth Spellman from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Uh, Garth has been doing his best to get to some of your questions in the chat. So thank you to Garth for taking on that duty. Thank you to those of you who were curious. And before we go, I'd love to leave the chat open for a few moments. And I would love for you to tell us what are you excited to see stop by your feeders or your backyard or your neighborhood this spring? Tell us what you are looking forward to. We are so happy that you've decided to join us. And thank you to everybody who has tuned in uh, to this event, to previous events, to followed us on social media, to made a donation to continue to maintain your membership with us. It matters a lot. I see a lot of folks saying that Western Tanager is what they're looking forward to. I have to say the same. All right, everybody, we are so glad to have your support and have you as part of our community. Thank you to the Bird Conservancy, the Rockies. Thank you to Denver Audubon. Thank you to Audubon Rockies for your promotional support for this event. Couldn't have done it without you. Thank you, everybody. The video recording will be available within a few days. Look for communication from the museum about how to access it. Thanks, everybody, and have a great night. Thank you all.